Hello, everybody. Welcome to this, our first uh, Engineering and Technology Management Distinguished Speaker Series event for the fall term. And so today we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Richard Corsi talking about indoor air quality and insights for managers. Dr. Corsi is our Dean of Engineering and Computer Science at Portland State University. He comes to us from the University of Texas at Austin and has a, had a long and distinguished career in the research area of indoor air quality, a topic that is of key importance to all of us. So before we get started, um, I wanted to mention this is a part of a series of events that we have coming up this week. And so our first event, this one on the indoor air quality, coming up on Thursday, we are having a, a, a new student welcome for people newly admitted to all different majors of the College of Engineering and Computer Science. We have information here. You're welcome to contact us as well. We have a new and prospective student orientation for the engineering and technology management department coming up on Friday. This is open to people, even if they have not yet applied, but are thinking about getting started. We are enrolling people uh, for classes starting even on Monday. There's a process for uh, non-degree seeking that lets people get started even on the same day of class and have those classes count towards a, a degree at Portland State University. Um, we are entrepreneurial and able to be able to accommodate people. That flexibility goes and speaks to the very name of our College of Engineering. Uh, and then lastly, every day this week and every day uh, 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 throughout the fall term, we're opening a virtual office hours for the department from 11 to noon. People are welcome to drop in, whether they wanna just uh, ask a question about the program or say hello, feel free to, to drop in. We've provided the Zoom link in there at the bottom. We'll provide this information as well in our meetup group. What we have, um, we will end up uh, having time for uh, questions and answers at the end. If you have questions during the talk, please go ahead and enter them into the chat window and we will uh, take them in the order that they're asked. So with that, I want to turn it over to our uh, distinguished speaker today, Dr. Richard Corsi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. I appreciate it very much. And I think I'm going to try to get my presentation up now. If I've been, there we go. Here we go. And I just got to figure out how to make it full screen. Mm -hmm. Technology. Uh, here we go. Oops. You're not seeing that as full screen, are you? Ah, here we go. Okay, I think I have it now. Good? Yep. Good, all right. Well, thank you, Tim, for the, the introduction and thank you for this great, for this great seminar series. And uh, thanks to Melissa also for all of the uh, high-tech uh, guidance and help here as we get started. I'm gonna talk about indoor air quality and um, transition about a third of the way through my presentation to COVID-19 which is an area that I've been spending a lot of time on recently. But I'd like to start with just explaining my motivation and hopefully your motivation for wanting to understand more about indoor air quality, but it's my motivation for why we should all care about indoor air quality and certainly why I do. So I've got um, six numbers on the screen here. Um, all of these numbers have the same units. The units are years. Rather than have you guess what they are, I'll just read them to you, right? 79 is the average life expectancy of an American. 69 is the total number of our 79 years that we will spend during our lifetime inside of a building. 69 of 79 years. We spend a larger fraction of our time inside buildings, domiciled inside buildings, than whales spend completely submerged below the surface of the ocean. 54 of our 79 years we spend in our homes. So if we're looking for an environment where we spend the largest fraction of our time by far during our lifetime, it's inside of our homes. So the home is a really important environment with respect to environmental exposures. 26 is the total number of years that Americans spend lying horizontally on a mattress during their lifetime with their mouth pushed up against a pillow full of polyurethane foam emitting toluene diisocyanate into your mouth. So that environment, the bedroom environment, the sleep microenvironment is an area that I've actually done 
a reasonable amount of research in, and it's really understudied, but it's so important given the amount of time we spend there. Six is the total number of years that we spend in our lifetime outdoors, and four is the total number of years we spend in our lifetime inside of a motor, motorized vehicle. So we spend a tremendous amount of time indoors during our lifetime, and this is what the average American does. This is about 10,000 respondents to a survey, and it shows where Americans are at any time of day on average. The large swath that you can see up at the top, the large gray swath, is our home. So you can see that this plot is dominated by time inside of our home, right? In the middle of the night, it's almost 100% of America is in their home. In the middle of the day, it's roughly 40% of Americans are in their home, right? Aside from the home, the two big areas you see here are the workplace, office and factory, and then this one down here, which is schools and school buildings, right? Work, schools, home, and then everything else is, you know, inside of our vehicle, you can see here inside restaurants and bars, but really work, school, home dominate our exposure to air pollution during our lifetime. So um, our lifetime, if we look at our, oops, I'm having trouble seeing the bottom of my slide. I'm sorry. If you look at the, uh, our lifetime inhalation exposure while indoors relative to outdoors during our lifetime of air pollution, for pollutants of outdoor origin, these are pollutants that are generally of outdoor origin that are emitted to the outdoor environment, we inhale up to 10 times as much of those pollutants indoors than we, than we do outdoors, even though they're of outdoor origin, by virtue of the fact that we spend so much time indoors and those pollutants come into buildings where we spend our time. For pollutants that are largely of indoor origin, there might be some outdoor origin, but they're largely of indoor origin, our indoor-outdoor inhalation exposure to those pollutants during our lifetime is 25 to 100 times higher, right? 25 to 100 times higher indoors. So most of the pollution that we're exposed to, air pollution in our lifetimes, we're exposed to indoors. That excites the heck out of me as a building scientist because that means that I can actually modify, change the operation, change the way we construct, operate, and maintain buildings to dramatically reduce my exposure to air pollution during my lifetime. And advance, let's see. Technology. Oh, here we go. So, so my research has focused on one very uh, focused area of indoor environments, and that is the, the interaction between indoor pollutants and indoor materials. So one of the distinguishing features between indoor atmospheres and outdoor atmospheres is the huge surface to volume ratio indoors versus outdoors. The, the indoor surface to volume ratio is about 300 to 1,000 times what it is outdoors, depending on how much cl clutter you have inside of a building. And the materials that we have inside of buildings are dramatically different from building to building, from room to room, from time to time in the same building. Uh, they're dynamic. Uh, organic films build up on materials over time. Materials break down. Particles deposit on materials. All that changes the sort of nature of interaction between pollutants and materials. Materials can be emission sources. And they also interact with pollutants in a way that uh, sometimes stores pollutants through adsorption and desorbs pollutants over time. So an example there would be, say, cigarette smoke, right? If somebody smoked in a hotel room six months before you went into the hotel room, you know that they were there because you can smell the nicotine and other, other chemicals associated with cigarette smoke slowly desorbing with materials over time. And you're being exposed to somebody's smoke from six months ago. Same with wildfire smoke, right? Uh, chemical reactions can occur on materials, and, um, and also particles can deposit and, and accumulate and, ev and eventually resuspend from materials. And you'll see that might be relevant for COVID-19. So to give you a couple of examples of the kinds of research I've done in this area, if I can just forward the slide, <laughs> I'll show you. Ah, here we go. So uh, this first example is uh, ozone reactions with indoor materials. So this is a uh, typical plot, kind of a plot of outdoor ozone concentrations, which are the blue curves. Uh, and that's the outdoor ozone concentration in parts per billion versus the indoor ozone concentrations in three high school classrooms, all right? And the two blue plots at the top are ozone monitors we actually retrofitted on the tops of seven different high schools. And CAM stands for Continuous Air Monitoring Station for the state of Texas. So these are 
uh, stations run by the state of Texas a few kilometers away from the school. So we're in pretty consistent uh, concentrations with the, with the nearby CAM stations. What you can see is that the indoor concentrations of ozone are considerably lower than the outdoor concentrations. These are the same kinds of profiles you would see in your home or an office building or other buildings, right? The reason for that is that when ozone comes indoors, it's a moderate to high oxidant, and it tends to chemically react with a lot of things indoors. It reacts with paint, it reacts with carpet, it reacts with um, uh, wood in the indoor environment. It just reacts with a lot of things in the indoor environment, and that lowers its concentrations indoors. It also generates a whole lot of other reaction products that we often don't think about uh, when those chemical reactions occur. So this is a plot that shows uh, sort of the dynamics of ozone reactions with materials. What we find, and this is for a whole bunch of different green building materials from a study I had with the US Green Building Council, is that if you look at the vertical axis here, just think of this as sort of the reactivity of the material with ozone. Don't worry about the details of what deposition velocity means. The higher that value, the more reactive the material is with ozone. And this is elapsed time of exposure to a typical indoor ozone concentration. You can see this wide variation in materials in terms of their reactivity. You can also see that over the course of a day, the reactivity of materials actually goes down. And that's because there's reaction sites on these materials that are being consumed by ozone molecules. And if you're consuming those reaction sites, the material becomes less and less reactive. There's just not as many places, molecules, for ozone to react with. You can see kind of a leveling off over time. I don't have deep time to get into that feature, but it's really interesting. When we turn the ozone off, in this case for um, 24 hours, and then we turn it back on, we see that the materials regenerate. All of a sudden, the materials are as reactive as they were before they decline when we hit them with ozone, which is another interesting phenomenon. It's a really complex chemistry going on when we have ozone reacting with materials. Importantly, oxidized reaction products are generated with all of these reactions, and some of those oxidized reaction products are at least irritating and at worst, toxic themselves. So this chemistry can generate this sort of new brew of chemicals in the indoor environment that may not be good for you. A second example of, of ozone in the indoor environment deals with schools. So I was the lead on a study of 46 classrooms in seven high schools. It was a four-year study, and we analyzed classrooms for four days, four times each over a two-year period, 46 classrooms. And this is a plot that shows ozone decay rate. This is essentially, think of this as sort of rate of removal of ozone in, in a classroom environment. These are actual classrooms for seven different classrooms. And the total bar corresponds to the total ozone decay rate when students are actually present in the classroom, when we, when we measured when students were there. And the blue portion of the bars is after the students left the classroom, all conditions were kept the same. And you can see this dramatic lowering of ozone uptake in the classroom. Why is that? The reason is that ozone loves to react with people, right? It reacts with this molecule that you see here on this slide, which is called squalene. Ozone loves to attack carbon-carbon double bonds. And this is a, a molecule in our skin oil, squalene. It's actually supposed to protect us from oxidants. That's one of the reasons it's there in our skin oils, right? But it consumes a lot of ozone. So it turns out in a classroom environment, students consume about 75% of the total removal of ozone. Students themselves are the contributors to a huge fraction of the ozone that's removed. One of the things we found in this study was that um, a lot of male students, especially in high schools, use this body spray called Axe. So between periods, we see them going out in the hallway, reaching into their book packs and spraying themselves with this Axe body spray. And, and we went and took the 10 most commonly purchased Axe body sprays, did chemical analysis of them, and they contain uh, two different molecules that you see here, right? One's hydromyrcene and the other one is linalool alcohol. And each of these molecules has carbon-carbon double bonds in it, so ozone likes to react with these as well. So not only is ozone reacting with the skin oils of students in the classroom, it's also reacting with the kinds of body sprays and perfumes and those kinds of things that they put on them to generate all sorts of interesting byproducts. By the way, we saw these two chemicals, which are in every single Axe body spray. We've seen them in all 46 classrooms we've sampled in our study. And there really are like no other sources of these chemicals. So Axe body spray is pervasive and it's affecting the air quality in high schools, in, at least in Central Texas. 
So human surfaces impact indoor air quality and personal care products can also impact indoor air quality. One of the things that happens when you react a person with ozone is you form from, from the squalene reaction is you form interesting byproducts. So this is a experiment done not by me, but by uh, Charlie Weschler and Armin Wisthaler, two great researchers in my field, where they had a chamber set up, a 30 cubic meter room, so a pretty decent sized chamber. They had, and you have to multiply these numbers by 10, 30 parts per billion of ozone uh, in the room. And then they had, quote, two large Danish men walked into the chamber in this, uh, in this room. And you can see immediately at 10 a.m. they walk in, the ozone concentration drops to about half of its value. And you start seeing the occurrence of two chemicals, which are both byproducts of squalene reaction with ozone, 6-methyl-5-heptene-2-ohne and 4-oxopentanol. And they accumulate to levels that together are about 25% molar yield or so. Uh, in other words, for every mole of ozone you react, you get about 0.25 moles of these chemicals. Now, 4-oxypentanol is interesting because we know at very high concentrations in the occupational workspace, uh, this can cause workspace-induced asthma, asthma that people develop in the workspace, at concentrations much higher than you actually see here, much higher than a couple parts per billion. But still, it kind of begs the question that as ozone levels increase and ozone's reacting with our bodies and 4-oxypentanol is generated and comes into our breathing zone, effectively, we're constantly breathing this stuff. And if we live in a place like Houston or Los Angeles or a place with high ozone levels, we're going to be breathing higher amounts of this. So that's gotten some people to think, could long-term exposures to this chemical actually cause us to, you know, to, to become susceptible to developing ozone? And the last example for schools, and then I'll get into COVID-19, is one invo involving particle resuspension. So in all 46 of these classrooms I mentioned to you, we did lots of particle measurements. And what we saw was very fascinating with respect to levels of particles in the air. This is a three-day plot for one classroom as an example, but we see similar for all 46 classrooms. And this is the particle concentration for particles less than 10 microns in diameter. Give you an idea, cross section of human hair is 50 to 100 microns in diameter. So these are pretty small particles. And what you see is the dark spikes here correspond to the indoor particle concentrations in the air. The lighter curves are the outdoor particle concentrations in the air. During the course of a day, a school day, when you look from you know, eight to about four in the afternoon, eight in the morning to four in the afternoon, you see all these spikes. Those spikes correspond to students coming into a classroom, students leaving a classroom, and certain activities that are going on in a classroom where students get up and move around. Every one of those is related to resuspension of particles, largely off of the floor and some off of tables and desks, et cetera, right? So we see that resuspension by compression of the foot on the ground or dragging a foot on the ground causes this resuspension of particles that accumulate on surfaces. We see that every single day, and you'll see a spike at 8 p.m. every single night that spike corresponds to when the custodian comes into the room to clean. So the custodian's being exposed to the resuspended particles. This raises an interesting question. If COVID-19 in a classroom, if we have viruses that come out on droplets or even small particles that deposit on surfaces and they accumulate on surfaces over the course of a day, the last class that comes in where we have this resuspension of stuff off the floor could be exposed to viruses in those particles that come into the air at that time. So th there's a real interest in this topic right now. It's does resuspension of particles actually create another source of SARS-CoV-2 virus that people are exposed to? In our study, we found statistically that classrooms that had carpet in them had much higher amounts of resuspension and much higher uh, particle concentrations in the air overall during the study relative to vinyl comp flooring. Vinyl comp flooring is impermeable. It's easy to wet mop in the evening by the custodian to clean. It's also easier to disinfect. So this begs the question also, should we be thinking about replacing carpet in buildings right now for this very reason with, with impermeable surfaces? So that's all I'm gonna say about my research. That's just a tidbit, a small kind of tidbit of the kinds of things that I do and why I'm motivated to do the things that I do. Um, and I wanna, I wanna pivot now and talk about uh, COVID-19. I've been interested in, in this since way back, and I think my first tweet about COVID-19 was January 20th, and I, I tweeted, the world should pay attention, right? 
because it was obvious that something big was happening in China. And then in February, and I, I started following Chinese media because first of all, there's a lot of great aerosol scientists in China, some, some of whom are good friends, China and, 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 and especially Hong Kong University in Hong Kong, right? And I was following Chinese media and on February 19th, 12 days after President Xi told President Trump that the airborne route was significant, right? On February 19th, this appeared in a news outlet in China. It basically says, it's, aerosol, it's, it's in aerosols. And if you're in a building with lots of people that's poorly ventilated, the aerosols are a transmission route. So the Chinese were saying this way back at the very beginning. And it was at that point that I started doing modeling. I was trying to collect the data that I could and trying to do mathematical modeling to figure out, you know, what are the worst environments to be in, et cetera. But there was still a lack of data there. So kept sort of, kept sort of improving that model over time. But this goes all the way back to February 19th. And that's really important to know, right? We're over 200,000 deaths in the United States right now. In 1918, the H H1N1 pandemic caused approximately 675,000 deaths in the United States. We are on a trajectory, unless we're really, really lucky, with a great, incredibly effective vaccine that everybody gets vaccinated with by next summer. We're on a trajectory to probably surpass the 1918 flu in terms of deaths by next summer. That's sad. This is 102 years later. We have a lot greater technology now. We have a much greater understanding of aerosols, right? We have absolutely failed as a nation to deal with this problem. And, and one of the reasons is, I'll come to in just a moment, but, but keep in mind that deaths are one part of the story. Um, morbidity and sickness is another part of the story. And it, it appears what's emerging is that there may be long-term health consequences to the respiratory system and the hearts and maybe other parts of the body for people that survive COVID-19. As you can see here, uh, scarring of tissues from a person, uh, lungs, a person, and that, that's scarring that's not, you can't go back on, right? Person who had COVID-19. And you're hearing more and more stories now about, about people that have these long-term health effects, long-term after six months. All right, exposure pathways and aerosol fate. So, we know the four major, we, we should know the four major exposure pathways are direct contact where you shake hands with somebody and then you put your hands in your mouth, your nose, your eyes, right? Two is fomites, so contaminated surfaces that you touch and then you touch your face, your mouth and your nose and your eyes, right, and get infected. Three is what, what, we, what most people call close contact. I call it near field, but it's close contact where you're really close to an infector who's speaking or even breathing uh, or yelling or singing or whatever they're doing they're spewing a spray into your face that's a combination of large droplets and really concentrated tiny particles, which we call aerosols, right, in your face. And then four is what I call the far field, which is an individual that's far away from an infector, but in the same indoor space. And as long as this infector space stays in this space, we're gonna have a buildup, an accumulation of tiny particles in the air that contain the SARS-CoV-2 virus that this person can breathe, all right? This is, the, this is the pathway number four that our country has absolutely neglected. Our federal government has neglected and therefore states have neglected. And I think this has caused a lot of people to die, right? We haven't accounted for this pathway properly. And even the CDC is just flailing, trying to get a message out and then pulling it back as you saw over the weekend. And the World Health Organization has been a joke on this. It's really been horrible. Um, the fate of particles when they're released from an infector, they can deposit on surfaces, including clothing. Remember I showed you how much ozone reacts with humans. When you have a lot of humans in, sp in a space, a lot of particles, just like ozone, they can deposit on surfaces. Ozone reacts, but particles can deposit on surfaces at rates not that different than ozone removal to surfaces. And so in, if you have something like a classroom, a, a lot of particles that may contain the virus are going to attach to clothing of students, the hair of students, and that type of thing, right? Um, ventilation, so basically removal of the particles that contain the viruses to the outdoor environment. Control, using a portable air cleaner or, uh, or filters or UV, ultraviolet rad irradiation in a mechanical system. And then the one we don't want is uptake into our respiratory systems, right? That's another removal mechanism for particles that contain the virus. Uh, I do wanna say with respect to close contact and near field, the six foot rule is really a ruse. There's nothing magical about six foot. There's no science behind it at all. It's something that was sort of made up, uh, you know, 
70 or 80 years ago, and the medical community is kind of stuck by it, right? But, but it's really not a good rule, right? So I just wanted to point out here that if we just look at gravitational settling, right, as, as an important mechanism for particles, and we look at, and we take Stokes' law, which is basically a balance between gravitational forces and drag forces, we can do a pretty good calculation and show this experimentally of how fast it takes for a particle to settle 1 from 1.5 meters, roughly at a mouth zone, to, to the floor, okay? Um, and if we know that time, the time it takes to settle, we can multiply that by the free stream airspeed in indoor environments, which is typically five to 15 centimeters per second. We can multiply it by that and get a total distance that a particle will travel, all right? So if we do that, if you look at 0.5 micron particles, which is probably about the smallest particle that, um, that, that, can hold, that we've been able to find, research has been able to find viruses in, um, it takes it 56 hours to, to go 1.5 meters. It can travel 10 kilometers. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty long building, right? Those particles are not going to just settle out by gravitational settling inside of a building. They're going to stay in the building as long as the air stays in the building. One micron particles, 2.5 kilometers. Five micron particles, 100 meters, 300 feet. And if you look in the medical literature, especially, there's this sort of weird thing that you see over and over again, five micron particles drop out within six feet. That's just bad science. It's not true and it doesn't happen, right? Five micron particles stay suspended. 10 micron particles stay suspended for about 80 feet, 25 meters. 20 micron particles for about you know, 20 feet. You have to get up to 50 micron particles before you get to sort of dropping out within three to six feet. And even then, if the person coughs, that particle can be, can be the jet, the buoyant jet associated with a cough can actually transport that particle up to 20 feet. So this thing about six feet is weird. It's a ruse, it's not a rule. And you can even go back to 1918. This is a newspaper article from what is now UC Davis and then the agricultural farm for UC Berkeley. And they wrote an article about research going on at Harvard University where they actually had a graduate student gargle <laughs> with a, a germ-laden liquid. It's hard to get graduate students to do these things anymore. And then to stand at a table and speak, and they were finding, um, they were finding uh, bio agents in little bowls they set up to 12 feet away, up to 10 to 12 feet away just from speaking, right? And the moral of this story in this newspaper, if you see here, is wear your mask. And in 1918, people were fined if they didn't wear their masks. And the general public was a lot more responsible than they are today in terms of wearing their masks. So I find this very interesting historically. So a little bit about sources of emissions, right? So we know that, that you can emit particles that contain viruses from br simply from breathing, all right? From speaking, which is the main mode for those that are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, they're not showing symptoms yet. Singing, you've heard a lot about singing in the newspapers, which is like very loud speaking. Coughing for sure. Probably from flushing, fecal matter that becomes airborne, although more research is no needed on that. and then resuspending like I just mentioned. It's really important to understand that the virus is not naked. The virus doesn't travel around by itself in air. It's embedded in the particles that come out of the respiratory system, right? The virus itself is about 0.1 microns in effective diameter. So if you look at something like a one micron particle, the volume of a one micron particle is 10 cubed so about a thousand times larger volume than a virus. If you look at a 10 micron particle, like an example I just gave you, it's a million times larger than a virus. So you can fit a lot of viruses in a one micron particle or a 10 micron particle. The particles that come out of our respiratory system are a combination of mucus and saliva. Normally, once they come out of our mouths, within about a second or so, the water, the volatile fraction of the mucus and saliva is driven off, it's evaporated, and you're left with more solid mucus and saliva with a with a virus embedded inside of it. Particle sizes vary from less than 0.3 microns to 200 microns. Again, the cross-section of human hair is 100 to 200 microns. And I want to point out that a small fraction of the viruses that come out of our body are actually infectious. So we may have a thousand viruses come out with a cough, right? Well, actually a lot more than that, but for, for, for a thousand viruses that come out, right? embedded in particles, it may be only one of them is infectious, right? 
or for 100 viruses, uh, maybe we have one, 1%. But that's kind of the range of infectious viruses we're talking about, 0.1 to 1%, which is also similar for influenza. So for coughing, there, there's some great data on coughing for influenza, and people are mining these data and trying to apply them to SARS-CoV-2, since we don't have data from actual patients with SARS-CoV-2 yet. What you see on the right is the number of particles per cough. Number of particles for a single cough for somebody who's inf infected with influenza, so that's the, the darker of the bars, and after they've recovered from influenza, and this is the total number of particles between 0.35 and 10 microns. These are particles that can stay suspended in air for a long period of time, right? I want you to notice the variation here. We have numbers that are everywhere from less than 1,000 particles to over 300,000 particles. So there's a huge variability in the amount of particles that come out of an infected person. The plot on the left corresponds to infector number eight on the right, so the third most significant infector on the right. And this plot shows the number of particles per cough, but this time discretized by actual particle sizes, up to about 10 microns. So again, these are particles that will stay suspended in air for a long period of time, right? You can see that once you get past about 2.5 microns, the number of particles is very, 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 very tiny. So by number, the number of particles that you'll see coming out of a person coughing is dominated. You know, for every large droplet, you've got thousands to tens of thousands of tiny droplets coming out. The mean value here for all of these studies is about 75,000 droplet uh, particles per cough, but a huge, huge standard deviation. The range again is less than 1,000 to over 300,000. Speaking is the, is the main mode of transmission for somebody who's asymptomatic. Doesn't know they're sick, doesn't feel sick, doesn't look sick, walks around, goes to bars, goes to restaurants, goes to the classroom, and speaks, all right? And, and these are some great results from a study done at UC Davis about a year ago that show the number of particles emitted per second when somebody's speaking, and they had a standard sentence for doing so, versus the amplitude of their voice. So as their voice gets louder, you can see from, and this is data for 10 individuals, five men and five women, as the amplitude increases, you get a net increase in the number of particles per second. And this is on a log scale. So these are pretty big changes, right? And you'll notice that, that there's a couple of super emitters up here that are emitting anywhere from 100 to 200 particles per second when they're speaking loud. So there's differences here too. Uh, the far left here is just one individual amongst these. I believe it was a female, and there really wasn't any differences between males and females. Um, but you can see, again, it, you can see a, a, a more focused relationship here between amplitude and number of particles per second. And the middle plot is very important because this shows the number of particles per second discretized by particle size. So what you can see here with the loud speaking, say the red dots, right, and for all of the other ones as well, even less amplitude, is the mode, the place where you find the most particles is around one, a little bit more than one micron in size. All right, so that becomes a very important particle size. It's also roughly the smallest particle size where anybody's been able to find a SARS-CoV-2 virus so far, right? So this becomes very, very important. A reasonable range of emissions is, if you convert seconds to minutes, is 300 to 3,000 per minute. Super emitters, 12,000 particles per minute. A super emitter in six minutes of speaking loudly will emit about as many particles as the mean emission of a single cough in the plot that I just showed you. So speaking can be very, very important. Breathing, normally about a factor of 10 lower emissions than speaking. We know from a great paper published in March 2020, this is the one that really got me excited, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that the half-life of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in aerosols, through a bunch of really wonderful experiments, is about the same as SARS-CoV-1. In fact, it's almost identical to the original SARS uh, coronavirus, right? It's about a half-life of 1.1 hours, right? You can see a, a range of experiments here that can actually go higher than that. But 1.1 hours is a long time for a half-life. That means half of the viruses are inactivated within 1.1 hours, but the other half are still activated, right? Um, in a lot of buildings, air doesn't stay in the building for 1.1 hours. So this tells us that viruses are gonna stay activated in the air in most buildings. If you convert that to a decay rate, it's 0.63 per hour. When you look at 0.63 per hour and you compare that to air exchange rates in buildings, that's kind of in the ballpark of air exchange rates for people's homes, 
for residential buildings, which varies anywhere from about 0.25 per hour to maybe one per hour, all right? If you look at most other buildings, school classrooms, office buildings, certainly hospitals, high-tech buildings, that kind of thing, um, that decay rate for SARS-CoV-2 is tiny compared to the air exchange rates in a lot of buildings, which means for all intents and purposes, we can neglect it. The viruses are gonna stay active in air. A concept that we, people don't talk about enough is what I call deposited, oops, deposited, uh, I'm sorry, is uh, deposited inhal inhalation dose. What deposited inhalation dose is, is the fraction of the total particles that you breathe, uh, I'm sorry, it's the total number of particles that you breathe in that actually deposit in your respiratory systems. And that's equal to the concentration of particles of a certain size, I call that size I, in air, number of particles per liter of air, times your breathing rate in liters per minute, times the time that you're in a space, like a restaurant or a gym or a car, multiplied by the fraction of particles in that size range that actually deposit in your respiratory system. The concentration is a strong function of how much is being emitted in the space, how many infectors are there in the space? How, where are they in their, in, in their infection? Uh, whether or not you're wearing a mask because the concentration of the breathing zones will be taken on the inside of your mask because your mask will reduce the particles a lot. How many particles deposit on indoor surfaces? How well ventilated is the indoor space? How well we control the indoor space with things like filters or portable air cleaners? And then the time the infectors in the space, if an infector comes into a room for, or a building for five minutes and leaves, there's not gonna be a lot of viruses in particles that accumulate in the air. If they're sitting there for two hours, particles with viruses can accumulate. The respiratory minute volume B in liters per minute, this is something nobody talks about, which is really important. If I'm sitting on a couch watching uh, you know, my favorite Western movie at night as a couch potato, I'm gonna have a certain breathing rate. If I'm in the gym doing aerobic exercises, I might be breathing 15, 15 times as much volume of air per minute. So doing aerobic exercise in a space where there's infectors is a really bad idea. You're gonna have a large inhalation uh, dose that deposits in your lungs. And then F dep I, the fraction that deposits in your lungs, is a function of the particle size, the breathing mode, and your activity. Breathing mode meets nose versus mouth breathing, and activity is, um, you know, heavy breathing versus sedentary breathing. Um, the human respiratory system for purposes of this talk is normally, uh, is normally um, divided into the head region. So if you're a nose breather, it's mostly the nose, the tracheobronchial region, which is most of the respiratory system, and then the deep lung, which is called the alveolar region. This shows the fraction of particles for different particle sizes that deposit in each of those regions and then the total respiratory system, right? I blocked off here 0.5 to 10 microns, which is a pretty important range for the particles that we're talking about, as you saw previously for the coughs and the speaking, et cetera, in terms of numbers of particles. Um, you can also see here that as you go from 0.5 to 10 microns, the total amount of particles that deposit in your respiratory system increases. This is the head region. So if you're a nose breather, which is what this plot is for, this is mostly can be deposited in your nose. This is the alveolar region, the dotted lines, which is the deep, deep lung, where you don't want things to go. And then the kind of dashed lines at the bottom is the tracheobronchial region. So you can see more deposits for many of these particle sizes in the alveolar region than the tracheobronchial region. This is very important. If you look at, say, a one micron particle, which remember is the mode for speaking and also very important for coughing. For a one micron particle, if you look at total deposition in the respiratory system, about 0.45 is the, is the fraction of the deposit. So 45% of one micron particles deposit in the lungs, 55% come back out when we exhale, all right? So not everything we inhale deposits in the respiratory system. All right, does that make sense? That's a lot of fundamentals. So you, you understand the sources, the nature of the particles, that the virus is in the particles, and so on and so forth. And this critical concept of inhaled deposited dose. So now I wanna get a little bit more practical, and maybe this is for the building managers, right? Is I've been stressing this concept called layered risk reduction or LRR strategy, right? And what LRR strategy says is these are the things we can do that we know will work to dramatically reduce our exposure and our dose to virus-laden particles, right? So now we have, for example, all of the folks in our indoor environment wearing masks. 
everybody, right? That's part of layered risk reduction strategy. And that is incredibly effective. If everybody wears a mask, that means that any infectors will have a mask on. And an infector wearing a mask is a half to a third of an infector in terms of the particles that are released to the indoor environment. And then if others are wearing masks, there's this additional rest, uh, there's this additional layer of, of um, protection. Reduce the source. I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. Require masks. Distance from the source. The six feet rule is a joke. It should be higher than six feet indoors, as I've said. Reduce the time spent indoors. If you can go to a pharmacy and spend five minutes there instead of shopping around in the aisles, uh, do that. Don't stay in that for a long time. I've, I've said for restaurants that are opening in New York, I was just interviewed by a reporter. I wouldn't go into one of the restaurants that's reopening in New York, but if somebody was, I would say, restaurants should not allow people in until their food is on the table. And then they should be able to go in, eat and get out, right? Take out is better, eating, out, out, eating outdoors is better, right? So reduce the time indoors. Ventilate the indoor space, that lowers the concentration of aerosols. Employ filtration or UV control. So now we're getting into more technical things. All of this stuff's pretty easy up above. It's all administrative. Ventilate, filter, clean surfaces, although increasingly we think that's not as important as the aerosol route. And then educate. I, I don't know why, but we have to keep reminding Americans that these things are all important to reduce your risk. And if you do these things, and I've done a bunch of calculations, especially for classrooms, you can get 90% or 95% risk reduction. You can inhale 95% less virus-laden particles if you do these things than if you don't do any of them, all right? So this works. I wanna talk a little bit about reducing the source. Uh, Max von Pettenkofer, who was sort of the father of the indoor air quality field, was quoted in 1958, uh, 1958, he, he wishes, 1858, is saying, if there's a pile of manure in a space, do not try to remove the odor by ventilation, remove the pile of manure, which goes to the, goes to the concept of everybody in, in my field follows is, get rid of sources. If we can get rid of sources, we don't gotta do anything else, right? So it's hard to get rid of sources when you don't know they're infected. You know, People don't look like giant piles of manure and don't smell like it. So we're dealing with people that are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So the only way to deal with reducing the source is to test and isolate, make sure people don't come into buildings if they've tested positive, de-densify, if you, if whatever the activity is, if you can have less, if you can have half as many people in the space, you've reduced the probability of an infector being in the space by 50%, or you've reduced the total number of infectors on average in the space by 50%. So de-densify. Have people work at home if they can work at home, all right? Require masks for all. That's critical. That's the one thing that's come out of this pandemic so far from a scientific standpoint that's been so striking is the amazing effectiveness of everybody wearing a mask, right? Reduce, and it doesn't have to be an N95 mask, reduce speaking to the extent possible. You know, I've talked about elevator etiquette. People should not speak in elevators. Um, speaking is, a, is the primary mode of emission from asymptomatic individuals. Ban certain activities. There shouldn't be singing indoors. There shouldn't be aerobic activities indoors. I wouldn't go into spaces where people are singing or having aerobic activities. And then possibly even replace flooring to reduce the amount of reed suspension. These are the ways we can reduce sources in the indoor environment that are very practical. Um, I'm gonna jump to filtration. In the interest of time, I'm skipping over some of the other methods, but they're pretty self-explanatory. I think like reduce time. Um, and, and I think <laughs> portable air cleaners are not, are not, had not been getting enough attention until this pandemic. They, they can be really effective at removing things like wildfire smoke from homes, which, which we've just been through. Uh, transportation related particles, if you live near a major roadway. You know, uh, dust from outdoor construction activities, right? What you want to look for in a portable air cleaner, and I really ad advise that people think about these during COVID-19 times and during wildfire smoke, is a HEPA-based portable air cleaner. HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air. Some people say arrestor, so there's a debate there, but high, high Efficiency Particulate Air. The key attribute of a portable air cleaner that's, of a, any portable air cleaner is called the Clean Air Delivery Rate, or the CADR. And the CADR, the clean air delivery rate, is the product of two numbers. This is important to understand. The first is the single pass removal fraction. So in other words, if I have 
a whole bunch of particles that go through a device, once through the device, what fraction of those particles are removed? If it's 0.5, that's 50% removal, okay? And Q is the volumetric flow rate in cubic feet per minute through the device, right? So an example, if we have eta is 0.5 and Q is 500 cubic feet per minute, our clean air delivery rate is 250 cubic feet per minute for the particles that I tested. The Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers will test portable air cleaners and they give them a clean air delivery ra rating for different types of particles. So for say tobacco smoke, dust, pollen. If you can do well for tobacco smoke, you're gonna do well for the SARS-CoV-2 virus and you're gonna do well for wildfire smoke, all right? So be looking for that. And, I, and be looking for numbers that are on the order of 300 cubic feet per minute or, or more, all right? Portable air cleaners are pretty neat little engineered systems. They have multiple layers of filters before the HEPA filter. Some of them have activated carbon and zeolites for removing odorous compounds, organic compounds, et cetera. And they're designed to have really good flow rates and motors that don't burn out if you keep them on continuously. So they're really well engineered little, little, little systems. Here's an example of how to calculate an equivalent air change per hour for a portable air cleaner. Equivalent air changes per hour, EAC, is the clean air delivery rate divided by the volume of the indoor space that you're trying to clean. That's as simple as it is. So example, if we have an indoor space, a small student apartment, you know, 600 square feet, or a conference room, or a small boutique shop somewhere, 600 square feet with an eight foot ceiling, that's 4,800 cubic feet. If I have a clean air delivery rate of 300 cubic feet per minute, I can divide 4,800 cubic feet into that. I get 0.0625 per minute. If I multiply that by 60 minutes per hour, I get 3.8 per hour. Essentially, what I'm doing with a portable air cleaner is, uh, is bringing in an equivalent of high purity air from outdoors. I'm like increasing the ventilation rate with, with clean air by 3.8 air changes per hour. That's, for this example, that's really good, right? Without getting into the math and the interest of time, this is just a steady state equation that shows the concentration of particle of size i. And what I just calculated is this term right here. This is the clean air delivery rate, eta times q divided by volume, right? So that's my number of 3.8. If my air exchange rate is 0.5 per hour, that's the value of lambda, then I have 3.8 divided by 0.5 is 7.6. If I'm not gonna worry too much about, uh, for small particles, deposition to surfaces, 1 plus 7.6 is 8.6. Essentially, it's steady state. This portable air cleaner for this 600 square foot space just lowered my aerosol concentrations by 90%. One portable air cleaner, right? The problem with portable air, and that's really good. I mean, that's great. You do that and wear a mask, you just lowered, you just dramatically lowered your overall re you know, risk by probably over 95%, right? There's been a lot of attention paid to the fact that portable air cleaners that you buy online are in short supply and they're pretty expensive. They run 200 to $400 depend, you know, for really good ones, right? So people have been making their own. They've been rolling their own, if you will, right? And, and what people have proposed, which I think is really ingenious at this time, I love this sort of entrepreneurial spirit of people during a, a time of pandemic crisis, is to get a box fan and get something like a MERV 13, minimum efficiency uh, re reporting val uh, value. I think that's what MERV stands for. Get a MERV 13 filter or better and put it on the intake side of the fan. So the box fan is sucking through the filter, which means the filter is gonna want to sort of seal up against the fan. And you can try to seal it around the edges as well. You get even a better seal. Uh, this is an ingenious one that was designed by a friend of mine who owns a filter manufacturing facility in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and he actually built this box out of MERV 13 filters. So there's four MERV 13 filters, one, two, three, four MERV 13 filters in parallel uh, and, and, and a box fan that's sucking through them. That dramatically reduces the resistance on the box fan and keeps the motor from overheating, which is nice, right? The cost for doing these things is 30 to 60 bucks uh, with filter replacement. So that's a lot cheaper than say $300 for a portable air cleaner. And there's been some reports of really good performance. So this is a box fan connected to a triangle that has a filter on either side of the triangle. I believe these are MERV 13 or MERV 14 filters. And this person measured black carbon in a number of homes with this do-it-yourself portable air cleaner. Black carbon is a, a, a perfect metric essentially for wildfire smoke. It's from combustion, okay? So when we had really horrible air 
in Portland for, for 10 days there or so, there was a lot of black carbon in the air, right? And this person shows the outdoor black carbon concentration, the indoor black carbon concentration, and the fan was turned on here right at about 12 a.m. And you can see this dramatic reduction in the indoor black carbon in their home from this makeshift fan, which I think is really fascinating. I can pause here. I can, I can, I can either speed up and sort of end here, or I can pause and ask if there's any questions maybe. Um, and then I've got about nine or 10 more slides on uh, some modeling I've done to show you the sort of relative infectiousness of different environments that you might want to avoid. Oh, I, I don't see any questions in the uh, chat window so far. So I'd say let's keep going. I mean, this is really right. good and uh, very relevant. So thank you. Okay, thanks. So uh, early on in this pandemic, I developed uh, a screening model, which I call the model for emission to inhalation dose, MEID, M-E-I-D, right? And the idea here is that if we can get a handle on uh, the total number of particles that have viruses in them coming out of somebody's respiratory system, we can predict using modeling how much deposits in the respiratory system of other people in the indoor space. And over time, as we get more information about the viral load that comes out, which may be a function of the particle size, there's indications right now from limited but some data that smaller particles have a higher concentration of viruses in them, which, which even speaks greater to the importance of aerosols, right? If we can do that, then we've got a model that's gonna really help us understand the relative differences between different spaces and how to control those spaces, right? So it's a simple differential equation. The rate of change of particles of size i with time is equal to the emission rate of those particles in size bin i divided by volume minus. This term beta, which is a collective loss term of particles multiplied by the concentration in the air. I'm focusing here just on the aerosol route or way back to one of my original slides, route number four, right, that we've kind of neglected to this point. So the model incorporates coughing, speaking, breathing, and it can easily be adapted to incorporate flushing if we get good numbers on toilet flushing, as well as resuspension, all right? So you can do all of these things based on literature. And the loss terms are either from ventilation, so beta i is equal to ventilation plus deposition for particles of size i on surfaces, plus engineering controls, which can be portable air cleaners or centralized filters, plus that which de deposits in our respiratory system, which is what I'm ultimately really interested in. I'm not gonna go through all the variables here, but, but know that this is all sort of packed into this one model. And the kind of output that the model gives you is, is something like this. So this is for uh, a classroom scenario uh, at a university, <laughs> using a classroom at Portland State University as my model. And I think I had 20 or 25 students in this classroom. And this shows the percent of particle removal if the teacher is the infector. That's sort of the worst case scenario if a teacher is three days before showing symptoms is the most infectious time uh, uh, of an infector. So if the teacher feels good, is in the classroom, is speaking a lot and elevating their voice, uh, they're spewing out a lot of really infectious particles, right? So this is the percent of particles uh, removed in a classroom if the teacher's the infector, and the blue portion is removed to the outdoor atmosphere, so this is just ventilating outdoors, right? It eventually finds its way outdoors. This is a poorly ventilated classroom of, of half of what's called ASHRAE 62.1 standard, designed for acceptable uh, indoor air quality. This is the ASHRAE standard, so this is what everybody tends to try to aim for. This is twice the ASHRAE standard, which means we're ventilating a lot. And this is the ASHRAE standard with a portable air cleaner, right? You can see most of the particles in these cases go to outdoors. In the case of a poorly ventilated classroom, we would start approaching 20% of even tiny particles. This is all 0.5 to 4 micron particles. It's deposited on surfaces. They have enough time to actually deposit on surfaces, sometimes far from the source. And the number 3.5 here corresponds to the fraction of particles that end up in the collective respiratory system of students in the classroom. All right, you can see that goes down as we start to invent, uh, ventilate more or if we use a portable air cleaner. Portable air cleaner removes about 31% of the particles that came out of the infector's mouth. That's pretty good, right? Um, and then this plot here shows uh, the number of particles deposited in the different 
in the different uh, sections of the respiratory system of students in the classroom. So in a poorly ventilated classroom, you see a lot more particles uh, deposited in total. Most of them, I assumed everybody was breathing through their nose. Most of them are deposited in the nose, but about 25% or so make it to the deepest lung where they can do what, where you don't want them to get, right? And as you ventilate more, you drop and drop and drop the total number of particles that are in the respiratory system. The, the value on top of each bar is the total volume of the particles that are deposited in the respiratory system. That's important because when we look at viral loads, we typically count the number of infectious particles per milliliter of stuff that comes out of your mouth. So if we know the number of infectious viruses per milliliter, and we know the no total number of picoliters that are deposited in the lung, we can use that to sort of extrapolate how many infectious viruses were deposited in different parts of the lung. That's what this model is aiming for. We're not there yet because we don't have that data yet. Okay, so here comes the fun part. And this is, this is novel and something that I'm, uh, that I'm fairly proud of, right? So I, there was a restaurant in Guangzhou, China called Restaurant X. Some of you have read about it where a number of people were positioned in this space, sort of the upper end here, where you see this air, these sort of air movement clouds in the restaurant. There was one infector, one known infector, right? And there were 89 total patrons in the restaurant, one infector, 10 got infected, and they were all in this region right here where the air was just simply recirculating with no fresh air coming in through this air, con air conditioning system. The great thing about this case was there's massive amounts of metadata, which we don't have for other outbreaks. So we know how big the restaurant is. We know how many people were there. There were video cameras that showed that this person didn't get up and walk over to the other tables, that show the actual distance that that infector was from other people in this space. Uh, a great researcher at the University of Hong Kong, Hugo Lee, was allowed to go into this restaurant after this event when the city was on lockdown, Guangzhou at that time, and he let him and his team go down and release tracer chemicals and do airflow measurements and got lots of great data, right? So we know what the air exchange rates were for this restaurant. They used uh, thermal mannequins and they put thermal mannequins sitting at the tables to see how the heating of the human body affected airflow patterns. And, and it, it, there's sort of absolute certainty in this case that this was aerosol driven transmission. There's just no other way it could have been anything else. So I use that metadata uh, as my index case, and uh, and I and I I took infector X and I made some assumptions about how much they were emitting. It doesn't really matter what I assumed about how much they were emitting, because in the end I'm going to take that same infector and I'm going to put them in other places. Your gym, a classroom at Portland State University, you know, other places where we say if an infector is the same as that person, what's the relative risk with respect to that environment? So that's what I did. I did estimate in the lungs of the people that were infected anywhere from one to 10 picoliters of total particles in this restaurant for a 75 minute event, which is roughly what most of the people were, were, were exposed to, right? That range depends on what I assumed about the emissions, but again, it doesn't matter because I'm gonna take the same emissions and put them in other places, right? And the mixing conditions in the restaurant. So I looked at this zone in the restaurant, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the upper zone as well as the whole restaurant Nobody was infected out of this upper zone. So all the other people in this restaurant weren't infected. There was a little bit of mixing out of that zone, but not a lot. So I've defined this new parameter I call omega. And omega is essentially the volume of, of particles that deposited in the respiratory system of those who were infected in restaurant X, divided by the volume particles deposited, I'm sorry, the volume of particles deposited in the respiratory system of people in other situations where infector X is present, divided by the volume deposited in the respiratory system in, in restaurant X. I don't want that number to be anywhere close to one. I don't want it to be even 0.5, right? I don't want to be close to restaurant X because rest, restaurant X was a catastrophe. It was a, an outbreak for people that were sitting in that zone. So I'd like to keep values of omega as much less than 0.1 as I can. That's my, that's, that's my rule, okay? And it's better than the six foot rule. Okay, so um, here we go. So I first apply it to a choir practice because you've heard about Skagit, Washington, right? And what happened there. I assume 50 participants and infector X from restaurant X in China is one of those participants. 
and I took a reasonable size room for 50 participants. I used ASHRAE standards for uh, music or singing classes to get a air exchange rate of 3.6 per hour, which is much higher than in restaurant X in Guangzhou. I assume that the people were singing 50% of the time, and I assume that that was highly elevated speaking. So I used the speaking emissions for that. The results are shown here. All right, so omega on the vertical axis. Remember, I'd like that to be less than 0.1. Um, if you're a poorly ventilated room where the choir practice is happening, your value is essentially one. You're in restaurant X, in the most infectious zone of restaurant X, right? Even if you follow ASHRAE standards, it's between 0.6 and 0.7. That's way too high for me. If you have ASHRAE standards with a, with a HEPA portable air cleaner, it drops it, still too high for me. If you're twice ASHRAE standard, still too high for me. Basically, we shouldn't have people congregating and singing. Uh, the concerns across the board. If you're gonna have choir practice, it should be done outdoors with physical distancing, all right? So that's one lesson learned from looking at Guangzhou in this way. If I look at a, a gym where somebody's doing aerobic activity, and here I make Infector X from Gu the restaurant in Guangzhou a staff member in the gym, all right? And so they're, they're maybe speaking, they were starting to cough a little bit, just showing symptoms, right? Um, and then I have a heavy breathing receptor who's on an elliptical or a treadmill, right? Again, I used ASHRAE guidelines for gyms, 3.9 air changes per hour. Here's the results. If it's a poorly ventilated gym, it's almost twice as bad as the restaurant in Guangzhou, China, because as I'm exercising, I'm bringing in large volumes of air into my respiratory system, right? If I'm at ASHRAE standard, I'm still worse than Guangzhou, China, the restaurant. If I'm at ASHRAE with a HEPA air filter, about the same as the restaurant in China. If I'm doubling ASHRAE ventilation, I'm still 60 to 70% to the restaurant in China. Avoid indoor gyms. I have, I'm a gym rat. I used to go to the gym six days a week. I haven't been since late February, right? Work out outdoors, that's it. I mean, if you have to go into a gym, if you're a, a worker, a staff member of the gym, make sure you wear a mask, make sure you physical distance, make sure you go outside as much as you can. Ride share, all right? So you, you, you call Lyft or Uber and you're one patron, you get into the car and unfortunately, Infector X and in Restaurant X in Guangzhou, China is your driver, right? Um, a typical volume for the cab of a car is around three cubic meters. Um, there's good literature on the amount of ventilation of a car going at different speeds for different types of cars, but I took an average value. And I assumed a 20 minute trip across town. All right, and I used very reasonable air exchange rates. So here's the results. 20 minutes in a car in a small volume cooped up with an infector. Uh, omega's over three. You're gonna get sick. You're gonna get COVID-19 if your driver is pre-symptomatic and, and, and releasing a lot of uh, particles. The way to deal with that from a risk reduction standpoint is you should insist that your driver wears a mask, you wear a mask, you should crack your window open. Even cracking a couple windows open by two or three inches causes so much additional ventilation in a car that you get this massive reduction in omega. So it'll go from three down to 0.5, which is still a little bit high for me. But if you wear a mask, you can drop this by another 50 to 70%. Now we're getting down to the range where I feel okay. Windows open, wearing a mask, everybody wears a mask, probably a low, risk situation in a ride share. Avoid long trips and busy commutes. If you do, you can get omega less than one. A lot of interest in elevators over the last couple of months. Uh, now you're gonna get into an elevator and there's index case X from restaurant X in Guangzhou, China, riding the elevator with you. Uh, in this case, I have a one minute travel in an elevator, which is a reasonable travel. That's gonna get you further than five floors usually. Um, uh, and air changes of 60 per hour. Elevators are really well ventilated, I've learned, uh, since I tweeted about them and had a bunch of elevator companies start contacting me. <laughs> um, so one air change per minute. What you find for elevators is that omega, in terms of background aerosols, is really tiny, right? So if, nobody if, if somebody's coughing and speaking, who's infected, it's still pretty small because of the higher exchange rate and the low time, amount of time you spend in the elevator. If they're speaking, it's less. If nobody's speaking, it's one one thousandth of restaurant X. That doesn't mean that elevators are completely safe. 
That just means in terms of the aerosols that accumulate in the elevator, probably not a big risk. But if you're standing right in front of somebody and they start speaking with you and they're not wearing a mask, that close contact could be a pretty major dose. And so you have to worry about close contact. So the new elevator, elevator etiquette should be everybody wears masks, nobody speaks, we need to reduce the density, two or three people in an elevator time, and keep as far away from everybody as you can, face away from them, face the corner in the elevator, and that will reduce risk dramatically. And finally, to the one that's on a lot of people's minds is classrooms, right? So this could be a, anywhere from a middle school to high school to university classroom. Um, it's a 700 square foot classroom. We have a lot of classrooms on the Portland State campus that are around that size. 25 students in the classroom for 75 minutes, right? Um, in one case, I assume that the infector is the teacher. They're just, just starting to show symptoms. That morning they start coughing a little bit. That's like infector X and in restaurant X, right? Um, I assume to cough every eight minutes for this simulation. Um, I have the teacher speaking 50% of the time, all right? When they're catching their breath, they're breathing and they're emitting they're emitting, still emitting, but, but one-tenth the amount is when they're speaking. And I've given them a slightly lower amplitude than index case X, and, I, and so I violated my rule here a little bit. So the teacher's not actually as bad of an emitter as in, in Restaurant X, and that's because Restaurant X was packed and it was Chinese New Year's, and you can imagine that people were kind of yelling when they were speaking. Um, I also took an infector who was a student who was not coughing and was not doing much speaking. They were speaking 10% of the time. And these are the results. And remember, for all these results, these are with no masks on. So if everybody's wearing a mask, all the bars go down. So for this classroom, if it's a poorly ventilated classroom, I use one third of ASHRAE because I measure that a lot in schools in Texas. I've done ventilation measurements in probably 200 schools and a whole bunch of school districts in Texas. Probably a third of them are so underventilated that they would, they would be in this red bar category. You know, this is way too high. I'm getting close to Guangzhou, China again, when the teacher's speak, speaking in terms of infection of students in the class. At ASHRAE, I'm at about 0.4. That's still a little bit too high for me. If I use a portable air cleaner in the classroom, I can drop it down below 0.3 to about 0.25. That's better, but not great. If I double the ventilation rate, I get it down a little bit more. If I double the ventilation rate and I recirculate three times through MERV 13 filters, I can get it down close to 0.1. And then if everybody wears masks, I can drop it well below 0.1. So I feel pretty good about that. Without masks, we're looking at about an 80% decrease from here to here just by improved ventilation and improved filtration. But again, if everybody's wearing masks, we can drop these numbers down a lot more, right? If the student is the infector, this one student who's not speaking much, I get much lower numbers, all right? Um, because, because they're not speaking, they're just breathing, um, not, not as bad. So the moral of the story is teachers are bad. Um, <laughs> in terms of infection, because they're doing so much of the speaking. And masks, again, decrease omega. So that's sort of it. I'll summarize here by saying um, there are four major transmission pathways that I mentioned to you at the beginning. Our country decided, our federal government decided from the start, let's only consider three, and let's not worry about aerosols. And we know a lot better than that now. SARS-CoV-2 is conveyed via aerosols. It's an, important, it's an important transmission pathway. And I think a lot of people have died, tens of thousands probably, because we didn't get that message out and people were being, going to bars, not wearing masks, going to restaurants. You know, um, it was just, it's just, it was just a, a complete fumble on our part. Um, the virus in aerosols can travel long distances away from the infector, the source. We know the sources of SARS-CoV-2. They're highly variable. You may be infected and emitting a lot less than somebody else who's, who's infected. We can't predict that. We can't take chances. So everybody's got to wear masks just to be cautious, right, in case it's a big infector. Deposited and inhaled dose is important. And I would use this as my gold standard for trying to figure out how to reduce infection. How do we reduce D? By reducing concentrations, by not engaging in heavy breathing in environments where other people are, reducing our time, et cetera. There are big differences in infectious potential of spaces, as I just showed you. And layered risk reduction actually, actually works, right? If we just follow as many of these as we can, we can keep our population a lot safer, our children in schools, 
and so on, and people in the workplace, et cetera. Sam, sorry, that was a long-winded talk, but. No, that, this was excellent. And um, Rich, I don't know if you saw that there's questions in the chat window. Oh, okay. Um, if you click on the chat, um, you'll see that uh, uh, Ed Levine, Christopher Hiller, Renee Fellman, and others. Wow, there's a lot of questions. Okay, um, let me go, just go down the list. I'll just go first, uh, UV cleaning machines. Um, I think that's the first one. That's Renee yep. Fellman, okay. Um, yeah, so ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, UVGI, can be extremely effective at inactivating viruses, even viruses that are embedded in particles. Um, the complexity with UV is that they can be dangerous if you don't do them right. You don't want it to, to uh, you don't want to have a UV impacting people's skin, and you don't want people to be able to look into the UV, uh, into the UV and, and damage their eyes, right? So, so um, in, in mechanical duct work, if it's done right, it, um, UV can be wonderful. Uh, if, if you're going to have what's called upper room germicidal irradiation, which I know some restaurants in Seattle are doing now, you put in a false ceiling um, so that people can't see the UV system, and then you use fans to recirculate air from the occupied space through the false ceiling and through the irradiation zone. That can work really well too, right? Um, the, the thing with UV relative to filtration is there's uh, gazillions of people, not gazillions, but lots of people who understand filters and how to put filters in place and understand filter technology. There's far less people who understand UV. So finding somebody who knows what they're doing to do it right can be incredibly effective. And you can get on the order of, in terms of sort of relative effectiveness, if it's done right, it's kind of the equivalent of up to 20 additional air changes per hour, right? It's almost like being outdoors. So yes to UV if done right and if done carefully. Uh, the next one is, can you speak to effectiveness of N95 versus other masks? Yeah, so N95 masks are, are kind of the gold standard. Um, so you're gonna remove not only the large droplets that somebody may be spraying onto if you're close to them, but a lot of the aerosols, all the way down to the sizes and less than that size of the particles that we know convey the virus. So an N95 mask can be incredibly effective, right? Other masks, and there's lots of different things you can make masks out of. There are surgical masks. There are KN95 masks, which I have uh, from some people in China who sent them uh, to me. Um, I have four of them, which I rotate. I use one a day, and then I put it in a window to inactivate from the UV. Um, so, so other masks, you know, uh, there are two or three teams right now in the United States that have been testing a lot of masks. They're largely attesting the efficiency of the mask. There's two things that are important is how efficient is the mask? What's the fractional removal of particles of different sizes when you inhale, right? That's the efficiency of the mask. And then does the mask fit, if it's fit correctly? And then the second question is the mask fit correctly? And normally where the fit fails is on the nose crease, right? That's where you have kind of big gaps. And anybody who's taken fluid mechanics knows the path of least resistance that if you're inhaling and you have big gaps next to your nose, air is going to just go right down that crease and your mask is going to be effective. So you need a mask that fits really well and that is efficient. Um, a lot of non, if you can find non-woven materials that to make your own mask out of, all right, that can be extremely effective. I mean, you can actually get close to an N95 mask with certain non-woven materials. I used to have a microfiber filter on my desk and I can't see it right now, but um, you can make masks out of those things. Um, oh, here it is. I was actually toying around for children to have them wear a mask with a nose mask, which you can use a nose mask and then a, a, um, a mouth mask. And the nose mask for me that I was playing around with was a pig's nose. So I'll put this on for the audience, right? And you can see in my nostrils, there's a filter inside there. And that filter is a, a microfiber filter. Let's see if I can show this to you, yeah. It's a non-woven material that's really effective at removing most of the particles of the sizes that I just talked to you about. And you can buy sheets of this stuff online. I don't know if you still can, but you can buy sheets of this, you know, all the, all the way down to a few microns, very, very, very effective. Even less than a few microns. Um, 
Yeah, so I would look at if you if you really want to know material by material, and if you're on Twitter, follow uh, Lindsay Marr, L-I-N-S-E-Y-M-A-R-R. -R. She and her colleagues and her team are doing tests on tons of different materials and, and reporting the efficiencies of different mask materials. Uh, and you can compare those with N95. Uh, next one, is filtration the most effective way to reduce the risk of spreading COVID, flu, and other viruses indoors? particularly schools, I, I, well, I kind of went through the risk reduction strategy. And so filtration is one of the weapons in, in that strategy. Um, I, I think from a practical standpoint, ventilating, increasing ventilation if you can, and if you can't, then filtration. Um, if it's a centralized system, then, uh, then you're sort of um, taking viruses from one classroom and spreading them to the other classrooms. But usually, if, an air handling unit handles enough classrooms in a school, did I see school here? Or maybe I didn't, uh, in a space that it's gonna sort of dilute it in the other spaces. So the other spaces won't be as infectious as where the infector is. But yeah, portable air cleaners, as I said, can be really effective and don't spread the virus between rooms like the centralized system does. I hope that answers that. Uh, um, 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 I have a question. Has there been any research as to the varying outcomes of COVID-19 infections depending on the deposition location of COVID aerosols? Oh, so this is a great question uh, from Anna. Thanks, Anna. Um, that, that research is going on right now. There's an, uh, the United States is lucky that we have a person named Don Milton who I think is one of the two or three best, if not the best airborne infectious disease expert in the world. He's at the University of Maryland in their School of Public Health. And uh, Don is doing that study, do, doing those, uh, doing research in that area right now. Uh, we know for influenza, so this is an extrapolation from influenza. It's not necessarily true for, for COVID-19, but there have been things that have turned out to be very similar between the two, like the percent of viruses that are infectious. For influenza, it's one virus that makes it to the lungs can cause an infection, right? Doesn't mean it will, but one can, right? In the nose, it's about a thousand required to cause infection. So there's a big difference between the nose and the lungs in the case of influenza. The speculation is that it may be the same for SARS-CoV-2. Don Milton feels so. He's more of an expert on it than I am, but but he's sort of working down that, that area right now. Uh, I'm not recommending the one on the link I posted, but asking about effectiveness, practical application of this. I'm not sure that's a question, but Renee, if you want to reformulate as, as a question, I'll get to it. Um, Marcy, I believe that referred back to the UV question and the link that Renee posted uh, uh, for okay. a UV product. Okay, hopefully I answered that then. I don't know what the product was. I'm sorry, I didn't look at the link. Um, but I can do that offline to just try, try to get through all these questions. I understand the math behind calculating air changes per hour relative to air cleaners and HVAC systems, but how does it work in practice? For example, I have a two-story home and only one point of return air. Yes, I understand that. Any general comments on the practical application placement effectiveness of air cleaners, HVAC systems? So what I think I'm getting here is that the, the one point of return air is not in ducts. It just flows through the home back to a closet or something where the mechanical system is with louvers to suck the air. And I think that's what I'm seeing this as, which is, uh, which is not untypical for a lot of uh, older homes. Um, it's a great question. It, you know, the airflow patterns in homes is, there's not sort of a consistent airflow pattern in homes, um, here you've got air flowing from all the spaces back to one space, I think. I would have a portable air cleaner in the space where you spend most of your time in your home. And um, this is primarily gonna be for wood smoke because you know, for COVID-19, um, uh, hopefully you'll know if somebody has symptoms or has been near somebody with symptoms and you can isolate them in the home, which is something else I can talk about if you like how to properly do that. So where you spend most of your time, and um, if you're using a MERV 13 filter or better in your mechanical system, uh, that's gonna remove a lot of wood smoke particles, but also 
almost all of the particles associated with COVID-19 that you have to work, worry about all the particle sizes. So MRF 13 filter in that mechanical system. Um, let's see. Could you discuss the application of principles and similar variables to outdoor exposures? So outdoors is great because it's sort of infinite ventilation. So remember, ventilation is a big risk reduction strategy. When you're outdoors, um, the air speeds are a lot higher. Even when it feels stagnant outdoors, the air speeds are higher than they are indoors. Um, you've got a lot more dilution. Um, you, you know, you don't have to worry as much when you're outdoors. I'll just tell you what I do, and I'm really serious about protecting myself and making sure that everybody I know is protected, is I do go for walks every single night, except for when there was wildfire smoke. Um, and when I go for walks, I bring a mask with me and I don't wear the mask when I'm walking unless I see a group coming towards me that's a family or something that I, or, I, or I've been on some trails over at Reed College before they closed Reed College. I used to hike down in the trails down below there and uh, I would always bring a mask and if there was somebody else in the trail, I would just put my mask on. Um, otherwise, I don't worry about the outdoor environment. Uh, you know, wear your mask when you're, when you're thinking you might have close contact with other people. For me, close contact is more than six feet and I've been saying that for a long time. So if I'm within about 12 or 15 feet of somebody, I'm putting a mask on. Uh, that's just being extraordinarily cautious outdoors. Um, this is a pretty important analysis with good practical implications. Thank you. Uh, after these scenarios, I'll, okay. Uh, okay, that's not a question. That's Tim making a statement. <laughs> um, question for Tim. Uh, okay, that's a question for Tim. Um, I thanks. believe, Dr. Corsi, that thanks. is actually all of the questions we have posted in our chat window so far for you. Thank you. Um, at this time, does anyone else have uh, any other questions that they'd like to post in chat? We can hang out for maybe 20 seconds to see if anyone types anything in there. Tim, you're, you're muted. So Rich, you've told me several times to avoid using an ionizing filter function in an air cleaner, I think. Am I correct on that? Yeah, avoid using uh, standalone ionizers or the ionizing function on a, on a HEPA air filter. It's just, A, it's not needed on a HEPA air filter. It doesn't, it won't hurt anything necessarily. The ionizers are pretty small when they're attached to HEPA air filters, but the HEPA filter does everything you need, right? So there's no, there's no need for any fancy gimmicks added on to it. Um, you do bring up a good, an interesting point, though. You just jotted my memory on something. If you are using a portable air cleaner uh, or even the, you know, a MERV 13 filter in your mechanical system, right, in your HVAC system, and or if, you, if you're a facilities person at a school that has to do this or, a, or, or some other building that has to do it, take precaution when you remove that filter and, and, re, and, re, and replace it with a new one, right? So, it's pretty easy when you remove a filter, even from a portable air cleaner, to just a little bit of movement will cause resuspension of any particles that contain viruses from that filter into the air. So I, I recommend wearing a mask, even wearing goggles, because you're gonna be very close to that filter if, if a sort of cloud of stuff comes off of it. Um, and put it carefully in a big plastic bag with a tie down uh, to, to, to toss it out. That's really important. What I've recommended to people in schools is if you have portable air cleaners and you're gonna replace the filter on the portable air cleaner, turn the portable air cleaner off on Friday at the end of school and don't replace it till Monday morning. By that time, most of the viruses that are on the filter will become inactivated, but still take precautions anyway Monday morning when you replace them. And we did have one more question come up from Renee Fellman. Uh, who would like to know how effective, and I believe it's UV cleaning is after four hours, if I'm parsing that particular question correctly. So um, I, I guess, Renee, maybe you can respond again in the chat. I, I don't know what you mean by UV cleaning. Are you talking about UV cleaning of surfaces with UV wands, or are you talking about... Um, are you talking about, um, okay. <laughs> How effective is that? Oops. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it wouldn't be a spray if it was UV. So there are these intense UV lamps that um, you can wand over surfaces to basically uh, try to inactivate viruses. Is there another one? Okay. Um, I, I'm going to admit, you know, I think it's important to admit when we don't know something. I haven't seen data on the effectiveness of UV wands. Um, I do know that, you know, ethanol is pretty good for cleaning surfaces if a robot can use ethanol, but, you know, the UV wands probably work well if you can get to all the surfaces. Um, but I, I just haven't done research on it and I haven't seen any uh, peer reviewed research journals, papers on the subject. So we had one last question about airlines. And so let's, let's use that. We're way into bonus time, but this has been very helpful, I think for many of us and better understanding the science behind it and real implications for practical everyday use. So thanks. Um, okay, airlines is a really good one. So commercial airliners tend to be extremely well ventilated, uh, almost to the extent of isolation wards and hospitals. So you're talking about 10, 12, 13 air changes per hour while they're in flight, all right? Not when they're sitting on the ground and everybody's getting settled, et cetera. In that case, they're not as well ventilated. So that's the highest risk time on an airline is actually when everybody's getting on before the airline sort of backs up and takes off. Um, so while in flight, very high ventilation, I don't expect that background aerosol concentrations in commercial airlines is going to be a big issue. Uh, airlines are also designed to have sort of these laminar flow zones. And so the air kind of circulates within three or four rows of one another through, throughout the plane. So if there is an infector uh, and you happen to be close to the infector, that's the worst case scenario. If you're across the row from an infector or you're sitting right in front of an infector who's speaking or coughing or you're sitting next to an infector, close contact is going to be the main transmission route on a, on a, on a commercial airliner. Um, that's the biggest concern. If you draw the short straw and you sit next to or close to an infector, it's probably going to be that close contact that's going to get you. If there's an infector behind you, you might have, you know, your hair might be laden with uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus by the end of the flight. Um, and then the biggest, I think, risk times for aerosols on commercial airliners is going to be when it's sitting on the ground and everybody's getting in and, you know, it takes a half an hour to get everybody seated before you back up and take off, as well as uh, crowds in the terminal and close contact. Terminals tend to have pretty large volumes and are pretty well ventilated themselves. And so in, in inside the terminal, before you get on the plane, it's going to be mostly close contact, I think. And, getting close to others. I think it's so important that everybody wear a mask in, in, uh, in those kinds of situations. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Rich. And uh, everyone, please join me in thanking Rich for uh, taking the time here and especially spending the bonus time. Um, this has been very helpful. I'm an electrical engineer originally, as well as an industrial engineer. And this is a lot more than I ever thought I would ever need to or want to know about this. But this is something that affects all of us every single day. And we're making decisions on whether you go to a restaurant and eat in the restaurant that claims to have spacing enough, or whether you're sending your kids back to school. We're all making decisions about this every single day, whether it's as a parent or as a manager for a business. So. Um, I think this is uh, critical information. So thanks again, uh, Thank Dr. Corsi. Thank all of you. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. Everyone's welcome to join us for future uh, distinguished speaker events as well. We'll have more coming up in the next few weeks. So thank you and have a good rest of the afternoon.